G'day, I'm Paul. So you know that if the Queen has a car that she likes being transported in, it's probably going to be right up there in terms of luxury forms of transport. And this is it right here. It is the Range Rover by Land Rover. Now this is interesting because this has been out for a long time now and I reckon it's starting to get a little bit long in the tooth. Yes, it is about to be replaced probably next year with a brand new version, but they have given this a significant update in terms of the powertrains for this year. This competes with things like the Mercedes Maybach GLS, the Rolls-Royce Cullinan, the Bentley Bentayga. Now, the reason I said that a little hesitantly is because they're kind of in another echelon in terms of price. They're all much more expensive. This used to be the bee's knees when it came to luxury SUVs, but it's almost too cheap now. The next generation needs to be far more expensive to really push it up. So this right here is the autobiography. It sits up near the top. It's priced at just under $270,000. But if that's a little bit too expensive, the range kicks off from around 200,000 bucks. Today, we're going to do a detailed review of this car. If you do want to skip ahead to other parts of the review, you can use the time codes up on the screen there, or if you're on YouTube, you can scroll down and use the chapters below. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our channel so you can find out every single time we review a car that the Queen likes riding in. Righto, let's talk styling. So, 10 exterior colours to pick from. Pretty much all of them are free of charge. You can get some premium colours that are around $2,000, but you can pick most of them without having to pay any extra. This is a pretty classic design. When you think about what this used to look like and what it has looked like in the past, it's more a evolutionary design as opposed to a revolutionary design. And I quite like the way that they have updated this without going over the top. So that means behind there, you can see the louvers for this new Ingenium diesel engine so that it helps with maintaining engine temperatures and also getting it up to engine temperature quickly in the morning. So you can open and close those as required and the, the car sort of takes care of all that stuff. Big Range Rover across the front here. So I think they were actually the, the people that started this. Um, I can remember way back when, when this first started appearing on Range Rovers, and, and I think this has sort of been a legacy that's carried on since then. I mean, you have a full set of Matrix LED headlights, including an LED daytime running light with a little headlight washer there as well. You'd be surprised, given this is off-road capable, when you do some proper off-roading and you get mud flicking up through these joins here and across the headlights, this actually comes in really handy, and you don't see that on a great deal of cars today. So around the side here, we have a big old set of 21-inch alloy wheels. The big downside here at the moment is that these tires are just road tires and we've just been doing some very basic driving to get to here and they are literally already full of mud so it's going to be interesting to see how well this does on our mild off-road section today i quite like the wheel design it's very sort of basic but elegant and then behind here you have a massive set of stoppers to team with that engine because this will pick up pace nicely with uh, that big diesel engine. Under here, you've got a set of adaptive air suspension. When the car's switched off and you open the door, this is currently set to uh, its sort of exit mode, so it drops down each and every time. It makes getting in and out easier. It kind of, kind of gives it that sort of tough looking stance. I quite like this setup here. So this is synonymous with the Range Rover. It's kind of like a brushed aluminium section that runs down the side here and then pushes all the way down the side of the car there. So it gives it a nice look. And you can see that cut line as well where the bonnet is follows all the way from the front. You have a camera built into that wing mirror, indicator built into there as well, and then come around to the rear. Around here, you have a set of LED tail lights, a split tailgate, we'll have a look at that in just a second. More Range Rover badges, and then because this is the autobiography, you get that badge along the back there as well, plus the engine designation. Um, I still think this is a really good looking setup, despite the fact it is as old as it is, and I'll be curious to see what they do with the next generation. Will they go down the path of Defender where they completely change the look of it, or will they sort of stay to this true form. Let me know what you think about the design in the comments below. So we are inside the Range Rover. This is what the key looks like. So you have lock, unlock, a button to turn the headlights on, a boot button, a panic button, and then on the back here you have a Land Rover symbol with a little bit of chrome on the sides there. It's a proximity sensing key, so you can just leave that in your pocket, and then you have a push button start up along the top here. So the question is, 300 grand or thereabouts with a few options on it. This is what your interior looks like. You can tell it kind of feels previous generation because a lot of the new Land Rover products uh, are using PV Pro, which is the all new infotainment system. And we actually reviewed that when we had the Land Rover Defender. You can watch that review by clicking up here. So this does feel comprehensively old in comparison, but for the most part, I think it is nicely presented for a 300 odd thousand dollar car. You can see leather along the dashboard here, along the top 
top sections. And then along the doors, you have some nice sort of classy looking wood grain. It's got a gloss finish to it. It's not that open pore stuff you see in some cars. And then typical Range Rover, you have these armrests here that are adjustable. And everything just feels nice and cocooned around the driver. It really is quite a premium experience to be sitting here. And yes, it does feel like your car is worth a fair bit of money. Now, what about all of your touch points? So. Over here, where you're resting your arm sometimes, that's nice and soft. The armrest itself is nice and soft, as is the door armrest. How soft is it all? Well, we've got our durometer. We've tested the main surfaces in this car to see how it compares with other cars we've tested before. Have a look at the link in the description. Now, build quality. Tell you what, this thing is built like a tank. Everything feels really well put together. I know a lot of car companies say this, but Jaguar Land Rover has spent a lot of uh, money and time recently improving the quality and the build quality of their cars. And um, so far, I can see the results of that inside this cabin. Everything feels nice and solid. Let's talk infotainment. Now, this is the old infotainment system. I mentioned earlier that a lot of new Jaguar Land Rover products use PV Pro. So this is the previous generation. It's called the Duo system because there are two screens here, one up the top for infotainment and one down the bottom for climate control. So I'll run you through both of them. So this is what the home screen looks like. In here, you have inbuilt satellite navigation. It is a little bit counterintuitive though, because things like traffic and if you want to save features and that kind of thing, you've got to have a SIM card in the car. So you have to put your own SIM card in the vehicle. So it means that there are two SIM cards operating here, uh, one for your maps and traffic and then one for the car's communication. So I don't know why it couldn't have all just been bundled into the one SIM card. But built into this is Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Both of those systems are wired, so you'll need a cable for those. I'll show you what Apple CarPlay looks like. So you can see there, it's just a tiny bit laggy as you flick through those screens. Also on cold starts, this infotainment system takes ages to get up and running and uh, get to the point where you can actually put navigation addresses in. So it is, <laughs> I guess it feels a little bit dated in that regard. And I'll show you what Android Auto looks like as well. There it is. So full screen again, uh, but you can see here that it is sort of slightly laggy as you try and sort of move through those menus kind of the same way that Apple CarPlay was. In terms of media, you have AM and FM radio along with DAB plus digital radio. You have a 19 speaker Meridian branded sound system. Then in addition to that, I love the fact here that you have television as well. So if I go to source, I can actually select television. We're here in the middle of nowhere, so we can't actually get any reception, but this has all of the tech and features you would expect from a high-end and premium car. All right, let's have a look at the screen down the bottom here. This drives the vehicle's climate controls and also the terrain response system. So I'll show you what this looks like. So you can see the screen takes up that entire section there. It's quite an impressive looking setup. They've even got the graphics there that change as you move between the terrain response modes. And I'll show you how that works a little later on when we go for a drive. In addition to that, you can control the seats here as well in terms of the massage, the heating and which segments are heated and then you have climate controls there as well. So you can even see as I sort of flick through some of these screens, it's just slightly laggy and that's the thing, it's a tiny bit disappointing I reckon. Ahead of the driver here, we have another display. So you can configure this however you like. Uh, it comes with features like your trip computer, the safety information, and you drive it using these controls here on the steering wheel. So I'll show you what it looks like with a couple of these different layouts. Um, so you can sort of flick between them and then it will adjust as required. Sounding a bit like a negative Nancy here, but um, yeah, these steering controls are a little bit tricky to use. While you're out on the road, they you can see they have different functions depending on what you're doing, and the screen sort of changes there as you go. But simple things like turning the volume up, you've got to sort of swipe your finger across like that. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, uh, and they can just be a little bit fiddly. So I don't know, I can see that they're starting to phase this stuff out. So obviously it wasn't that successful, um, but you know, you are kind of stuck with that. I think it'll get better with time if you buy the car and you get used to it, but yeah, it's just a small point of frustration for me. Now, what about safety technology? So you have low and high speed autonomous emergency braking. You've got an auto dimming rear vision mirror. You have a lane departure warning and a lane keeping assistant, radar cruise control. You also have blind spot monitoring built into the wing mirror over there rear cross traffic alert then in terms of parking you have front and rear parking sensors and a 360 degree camera let's have a look at what that looks like let's bring it up here um, look the quality is okay but you can see here that it's kind of uh, it's a little bit grainy as you zoom in you can adjust the views that you're seeing as well so we can go straight to a reverse view 
um, or a wide angle reverse view and it also shows you the sonar for the front and rear parking sensors. You can also do a semi-autonomous park if there is a gap that you want to get into that you're not quite confident uh, at parking in. And you can also configure trailers as well which helps you with uh, getting this thing parked if you're backing a caravan or something large attached to the back of the car. Now what about practicality if you do need to charge your devices? There's no wireless phone charging which I would have thought they'd have in a car like this but you do have two USB ports down the front here plus a 12 volt outlet as well. In terms of storing your phone and your device you can pop it down the front here if I just get rid of that. It fits inside the cup holders but you can also slide it into there as well which is a pretty handy spot. The interesting thing is that if that's not enough room for you there's actually a little hidey hole down here where you can dump a few more things. I'll show you that in just a moment but coffee cup it passed the test this morning especially if you have discerning tastes in coffee it will fit your tiny little coffee cup in there no dramas. Water bottles same story you've got these gripped teeth over here which means you can fit larger items in without them sort of disappearing too easily. Then inside the doors you can fit a water bottle without any problems but I don't think our big one will fit inside the door. Let's give it a shot. Mm. Kind of does if you lay it flat, but I probably wouldn't want to be laying anything flat in there just in case it leaked. Uh, in terms of other storage slots, so I mentioned this one before, so I'm going to move that out of the way. That goes all the way down there, which is pretty awesome. And then if you get this bottle, you can see how far that sort of disappears. So you can hide things from view pretty easily. Now in the centre here, you've got a little storage nook on the top here, but beneath that you have a fridge so you can pop your items in there and then switch the fridge on so everything stays nice and cool so pretty impressive setup two glove boxes so one down here that has all your bits and pieces fits the water bottle in without any dramas and then you have another one up the top here where you have a cd player and then a little bit of storage just off to the side and then another 12 volt outlet now let's talk about comfort features so you have four zone automatic climate control and if i jump over here to the climate menu and switch that on you can see here that the temperatures are adjusted using these controls and then to access your seat heating and cooling you just push this in and then turn and that will simply put it into heating or cooling mode and same story with your massage seats you can actually adjust the intensity by using this knob inside your seats menu in addition to that the steering wheel is heated using this button here you have about a million adjustments for your seat here you can literally move just the base of it the top section of the top half of the seat the headrest you can activate your massage functions and also the bolsters here you have memory as well the passenger has the same controls on their side up the top here quite intuitive you have in addition to your standard mirror controls the ability to lock the rear doors from opening and also the easy access mode so while you are driving one push of this will lower it down to the easy access mode if you have air suspension you may as well use it what are the seats like in terms of comfort so you're paying 300 grand for this are they comfortable yes they are it is incredibly comfortable in terms of the way that they hug you in while you're driving it just cushions you beautifully you know, it is the exact type of seat i would expect to have in a car with this kind of price tag your steering has tilt and reach adjustment and then in terms of our reach test all of this stuff is easy to reach while you're driving so you don't need to tilt forward to gain access to any of these functions let's talk second row so in addition to doors that suck themselves in around the car this is what your accommodation looks like if you're in the autobiography now i know what you're thinking it looks like paul doesn't have a great deal of room and that's because i don't have a great deal of room which is really surprising you look at the size of a range rover and I mean, my knees are like almost up against that seat. Yes, my seat is quite far back, but I still feel quite claustrophobic in here, especially with this optional um, entertainment system sort of right in my face. Um, knee room isn't fantastic, toe room is okay, and headroom is, is pretty good. So um, you can get a long wheelbase version of this. So if this is a problem and you're going to be carrying passengers, you can go long wheelbase. And it becomes even worse when you actually extend this out. So if I move my seat forward like this, because the the two seats here are completely electrically adjustable. You can see here that my knees are then inside that seat ahead of me. So I don't know, it just, just feels like there could have been a little bit more attention paid to room back here, but this is a pretty cool setup in terms of how much space you actually um, can use once it's all reclined and that kind of thing. You have map pockets built in down here. 
you have two USB outlets that you can charge your devices, two 12 volt outlets, little storage nook down the bottom, your third and fourth zone of climate controls. This is also where you control your seat heating and cooling. Uh, you can basically run all of that from here. Then you can also adjust uh, fan speeds through the center. You have a set of air vents there. In terms of the media display ahead of you, this is where you can select your music. You can also see navigation. Um, you know, you've got all the little bits and pieces here that allow you to make your life easier in the back seat. Um, over on the door, you have some interesting buttons. So I can control my window. I can then also control both windows at the exact same time, which I don't really understand why you would want to do that, but you can do that anyway. I can control the sun blind as well from here. I can mute the audio at the back. So if I'm making an important phone call, uh, no noise will come through and I can switch my lights on and off here as well. So pretty impressive setup and they've definitely thought about the passenger here and, and making their life as easy as possible. All of your controls there on the door for seat adjustment with memory as well. And then you have a little light here as well. If you go to exit the vehicle and there's a cyclist or pedestrian coming, that's going to warn you. Now, center armrest. This bit's pretty cool. So you can use this as a seat if you want. Obviously, it's not going to be a very comfortable one, but it can be used as a seat. One push of this brings it forward. Now, it's pretty slow, so we're going to have to use a time lapse here. There it comes. So up the top here, you have a remote control for your screens. Then you have a second tier with storage, an additional two USB ports, and then two HDMI slots for your screens. Then if you want access to your cup holders, this thing moves out of the way as well, and then it reveals a little cover here. And that little cover then slides out of the way to give you access to your cup holders. There it is there. They fit in nicely. You've got little grips there. And then you have a tiny bit of storage inside the doors. That's where our wireless headphones are at the moment, though. So, um, look, it's an interesting setup. It does feel nice and luxe back here. Um, but the only issue is the legroom. I would have expected just a little bit more space back here to, um, oh, just to allow you to stretch out. But thankfully, there is a long wheelbase version available. Okay, let's talk cargo space. So I mentioned earlier, this is a split tailgate. That means the top section opens and then the bottom section opens. And I love this because, I don't know, you could back this into your favorite sporting field or something like that, grab a seat on it. It can hold a fair amount of weight. So hopefully more than two of me. <laughs> um, you've got this cover then as well to stop things falling into the abyss that is all that stuff down there. Uh, beneath the floor here, you have a whopper. It is a full-size spare tire. That would be very hard to get out because it would be very heavy, but it does mean that you get a full-size spare. So if you are in the middle of nowhere doing an off-road safari, you don't have to be limping along on a space saver, which is good news. Um, off to the side here, you have a little 12 volt outlet. Then you have this cargo blind that folds into position and can be pulled out entirely. With the second row in place, you have around 600 litres of cargo space available here. Now, these controls on the side here, so you have suspension controls. If the car isn't already lowered, you can lower it from the back here or even raise it depending on what you're trying to load in. But there are some clever controls here in terms of getting access to more cargo space, even with your Lux second row in place. So you can see the driver and front passenger seats slightly move out of the way to accommodate the seats that are about to fold down into that position. This is really handy because not a lot of vehicles with this four seat arrangement can actually fold seats out of the way to give you more cargo space. So it will come all the way down. And then once it does come down, both the driver and front passenger seat then go back into their original positions. Now that expands the space to around 2000 liters. So it's not entirely flat, but it does give you a whole lot more storage room than you would otherwise have when the second row was sitting up. Now, what about our bags? I'll show you what they look like in here. So laptop bag there, and then a big suitcase in there. So beautiful carpet there as well. Okay, we've hit the road in the Range Rover. What's it like to drive? If you haven't driven one of these before, um, it's kind of like being in a magic carpet, except this is a more efficient magic carpet now, thanks to the diesel engine they've crammed under this. So it's a three litre, six cylinder turbocharged diesel engine. It makes 258 kilowatts of power and 700 Newton meters of torque, and it's mated to an eight speed automatic transmission. Now it's a mild hybrid system, which means the stop start process is nice and smooth, thanks to an integrated starter generator. But then when you sink the boot in, it just delivers a beautifully smooth dollop of torque. It's also worth pointing out that with 700 Newton meters of torque, I can lean into the throttle and it doesn't have to dive back through several gears to, um, to basically deliver you that torque. 
it really can just lean on the torque band and it means that at 2000 RPM you get a nice solid push in the back without having to wait around forever for it to actually do anything. One of the other things I like about this six cylinder is the unique sound. So even though it's a diesel, when you get stuck into it, it has a little bit of note to it. So you can at least hear it doing something and it sounds a little more interesting than just diesel clatter. Let's talk fuel economy. So Land Rover claims a combined fuel economy of 8.4 litres per 100 kilometres. Hmm. You're not going to be getting very close to that. So we're currently sitting on 16 litres per 100 kilometres. I will caveat that by saying that this car was running a long time this morning when we got here because it was quite cold and I was sitting in here while Igor was doing some stuff. So um, yes, it has been artificially running. The other thing to take note of is before we got here when I was doing a mix of city and highway driving, it was sitting on around 10 litres per 100. So close enough but you simply cannot escape the fact that it weighs 2.3 tonnes. I mean, you simply cannot get around that and eventually it will catch up with it, especially if you're idling and uh, if you are doing more low speed driving. Let's talk drive mode. So you do everything through the terrain response system. If you push it all the way in, it just selects auto mode and it will adapt to the driving conditions. Whereas if you push it up, it will basically allow you to switch between a number of off-road modes and on-road modes. So when you're through the on-road modes, you have eco, comfort, and then dynamic and dynamic is where it'll firm up the suspension give you a little bit more weight through the steering wheel i'll run through the off-road modes when we do some light off-roading later on okay so we are in dynamic mode let's slip it through here see that is impressive so despite the fact this is now getting on in age as a platform this thing still has some boogie and it I don't know, it just feels nimble enough to throw it around a bit yes it's no sports car and it doesn't feel as agile as the defender but it's just Pretty impressive for a car this size. Land Rover claims a 0 to 100 time of 7.1 seconds. We put it up against a stopwatch and this is how it went. Okay, let's talk about the ride. So air suspension and adaptive dampers, that means that you are getting a silky smooth ride. And even out here in the country, it's soaking up everything nicely. And it just feels like it's gliding along all the bumps and imperfections. It can feel a little wallowy at times, which means if you get the consecutive humps as you're driving along, it can sort of feel like it's floating. But when you're in and around the city and doing a long distance highway drive, this is the ultimate cruiser if you just need to get there and get there in comfort. Same goes for noise. There's barely any road noise that comes into the cabin. There is a little bit of wind noise, but for the most part, it's incredibly quiet in here. Now, the other thing that's worth pointing out as well is that if you're in the depths of winter, there's these little lines built into the windscreen that's a demister for the windscreen. So instead of having to wait for the car to warm up and then pump hot air out, this can actually just demist it much quicker, similar to the way that it does it on the back window. Let's talk visibility. So this is a whopper of a car. I can see clearly out the front there. Down the sides, the wing mirrors are big enough with a blind spot monitor built into them. Visibility out the rear is okay. Uh, it's, it's a sort of narrow uh, rear vision mirror here and then your headrests kind of stick in the way there. So you can see past them. It can just be a little compromised at times. If you are planning on towing, a lot of people will use these to tow a horse float or something sort of fairly big in stature. It'll tow up to three and a half tonnes with a braked trailer. And look, it'll confidently do that as well. With this much torque and I guess this much heft to it, it just feels really nice and planted on the road, even when you do have something big on the rear of it. And I don't know, it, it's pretty economical as well once you are doing your highway driving. At low speeds, it's not going to be all that economical, but once you're doing highway driving, it really comes down nicely with this diesel. Okay, what about the turning circle? 12.33 metres, so it's a fairly big turning circle. So in and around the city, you're probably going to have to do the occasional three-point turn. Righto, let's do some light off-roading. So I explained in our last video that I was going to come up with a new course for us to try out. And I've got something set up, but we'll have a wet course and a dry course. And the reason I say that is with the wet course, uh, if we don't make it up, the car slides backwards and I've got plenty of room to sort of for it to slow down eventually. Whereas with the dry course, when it slides backwards, uh, it slides towards a river. So <laughs> I don't want to drop the car into the river. Um, so we're going to have those two different courses. And what they're going to do is test the traction control systems up a slope where you have limited traction. So this should be a really good sort of mix between all the cars to give us an idea of how they perform. The common test we're going to have with all vehicles though, regardless of whether it's wet or dry, is a seesaw. So this will get us coming up and then onto the other side. 
In the middle, we'll have a transition where we'll have body flex. And during the body flex, I'm gonna try and open and close the door to see whether there is enough flex or whether there is too much flex and it prevents the door from closing. Then we'll also have an offset mogul where we'll be able to test traction controls and differential locks if the car has any of those. Now, onto the off-road specs of the Range Rover. So I mentioned earlier on, these are built for off-road driving and Land Rover's gone to town in terms of fitting this with all of the off-road kit that it needs as standard. So that means a 24 degree approach angle, that's the angle of the face you can approach before you hit the front of the car. A 23.5 degree departure angle, which is the same angle but in reverse. We have 220 millimeters of ground clearance, which can then go even higher thanks to the air suspension. 900 millimeters of weighting depth. And then in terms of our four-wheel drive controls, we have a center diff lock that can be uh, fully open, partly closed or fully closed, and a rear differential lock as well. We also have have a low range transfer case. Now, if none of that makes any sense, click up here to watch a video we shot before on four wheel drive controls that will explain it just a little bit better. Terrain response. So while we're out driving, I mentioned that I'd run you through this. One flick of this allows you to go between the different programs. So we have grass, gravel, snow, we have mud ruts, we have sand, and then finally we have the rock crawl program. You also have a low traction launch feature, which we will test on our hill as well, on our slippery hill. So for the moment, let's pop it into mud ruts. What it says is it recommends using low range and it also recommends going into the high suspension mode. So we won't use low range, but I will jack the suspension up. There we go, it's climbing now. What it does in these uh, terrain response modes is selects the correct uh, stability control program to give the car as much leverage as it can as it climbs these types of things. And in the Mud Ruts program, for example, it's going to give us a little bit more wheel slip where required. And it also enables hill descent control in forwards and reverse. So it'll catch us even if we don't make it up. So let's give this a shot. It is really slippery today and these are completely glazed over. So we're just going to try heading up here now. Oh, go, 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 go. Yes, we made it, fantastic. And this thing is an absolute beast. You could really just go anywhere with these. Ages and ages ago, I actually did a trip across Australia from Birdsville to Broome in a fleet of Land Rovers. Everything from the Freelander up to the Defender, including this, which was called the Range Rover Vogue back then. It really is just a machine. Now, hill descent control. I've got my foot off the brake here. What it's able to do um, is adjust the speed as you drive. So using the cruise control here, I can make it go faster or slower down the hill descent control so that we can actually keep on top of everything that's going on. So, and actually it works really nicely there. So it's just cruising nicely down the hill there. Very impressed. Okay, let's do the seesaw. Uh, the other cool feature is one push of this button enables the four wheel drive view on the infotainment system. What this is able to do is give us an idea of what the suspension's doing, what the differential locks are doing, and also give us a really cool camera angle as well. So if I hit the drive assist button, we get uh, the cameras come up and show us exactly what's happening in and around the car. But at the moment, I've got it on this screen here that's going to show us what the suspension's doing and also what the differentials are doing. So you can see here that we're partly locked on the center diff partly locked on the rear diff as we go over. Um, ahead of me, I've got a cool display on the head-up display showing the angle that we're on, plus our compass heading. So we'll come over to the center section here where we will have two tires almost off the ground. This has air suspension, so it's fully extending that suspension. So we probably won't get tires off the ground, but right now we should have full flex. Let's see if that door opens and closes, no dramas, very impressive. Okay, moving on to the next section. This next section is going to test how the traction control and how the differential locks work in an offset mogul situation, which is where we get two tires off the ground. So here we are, we're approaching it now. Okay, we are currently two tires off the ground. So it has detected that and you can see on the screen ahead of me here, let me just make the parking sensors quiet. You can see on the screen ahead of me here, we have the center diff lock and the rear diff locked as well, which means I can just roll out of the brake, roll onto the throttle, because we have both of those diffs locked, it's literally just walking through here without any dramas. So that's really impressive. And you're not gonna find this level of sophistication on a lot of cars in this segment. They really have nailed that feature. Right, our last thing we're gonna test here is the low traction launch. This is designed for situations like this where you've got a slippery incline and you need to get out of there without the car just completely dying. So let's test it out. I don't think it's gonna make it up here because it is really greasy, but you know, that's what the feature's for. We'll give it a shot. So low traction launch is on. It says gradually apply accelerator pedal until vehicle moves away from rest. I'll do that now. Okay, so I can feel it building up revs. Oh, 
that's that's so impressive. It's nervous walking up here. Oh, we're stuck. Hold on. It's going to stay in the throttle. <laughs> no, we're stuck. Um, yeah, I didn't think we'd get up there because you need momentum, but it got us up the start bit, which is pretty impressive. And that, I think, is the whole intended purpose. If you are on a big, greasy, uh, sort of wet hill, it's going to give you the momentum that you need to really just get stuck into it and go all the way up. Okay, the updated Range Rover. Look, this car is the definition of a luxury SUV. It drives like a luxury SUV, but the thing is it does off-road. This thing will literally go anywhere, and I think that's what sets it apart from its competitors. The problem is the rest of the competitors are getting slightly more expensive at the lower end, and then way more expensive at the top end. And now it sits sort of in between at this really awkward level. So I think until the next generation arrives, this will still be good value for money. When the next one comes, I think it's gonna get much more expensive so that it can sit into that next luxury slot. Let me know what you think in the comments section below. Would you buy a Range Rover or are you looking at something else at that price range? I'm really keen to get your feedback. And also let me know, is it important that this can kind of just go anywhere off-road or do you not really sort of care about that sort of stuff? Let me know in the comments section. If you did enjoy this video, make sure you like it and share it with your mates. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so you can find out every single time we drive one of these things. But until next time, take it easy.